So if you come by the church late afternoon on Sundays, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and you see some folk worshiping and hanging out, that's the church called Common Table. They'll be here worshiping in our building for a while, and uh, we'll have, hopefully we have good partnership with them. For those of you who were at the picnic last week, they were at the picnic there with us. And so the, the pastor and his wife, or the wife and her, the pastor and her husband are old friends of mine, and so they came over and visited and wanted to know if they could use our building, our facility, because they wanted to worship in a safe and whole place. And the board said yes, and they said, why not? So here they are. Amen? Amen. So don't be afraid to see them there, that they're here to worship. Amen? Then the second thing is this. We're doing 30 days of prayer, yes? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 So, when we say, give a report of what God is doing, Answer, because what happens is the person sitting on this side of the church over here has been praying, Lord, I need you. To, I need a word from you today, Lord. Help me to understand, because my problem is too big for me to handle. And Lord, I just don't know what to do. And then on this side of the church, or maybe here in the middle, someone says, You know what? I've been praying all week, and here, and here's what God has done in my life. And he's given me victory here, and God has done this, and you know, God has worked this week really well in my life. And the person over here goes, I needed to hear that. Why? Because when we report back on what God has been doing, we encourage one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. So write these three words down. Ready? I want you to pray for this actually four words. First of all, pray with power. Why? Because you have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Yes? Yes. One more time. Yes? Yes. So, power. The first one is, the next one is, pray with expectation. Yes. You expect God to answer. You expect Him because He said He would. Yes? Call yes. to me and I will answer. I will tell you great and wonderful things. Yes? Yes. Then Jesus goes even further. Jesus says, ask. And so here's the second word. It is anticipation. Asking is anticipating. God, what do you want to do? Lord, how do you want to lead me today? Lord, I am your child. How do you want me to go? Lord, give me. So we pray with anticipation. So we pray with expectation, because God's going to answer. We pray with anticipation, because we know that God is going to lead us in all of our endeavors. And the third one is pray with dedication. Okay, because sometimes we forget. Amen? Go ahead and say it. Come on. Amen. Because we forget. We get up early. We forget. I got a guy busy. And my dog died. My cat had puppies. The cow jumped over the moon. And you know, we forgot. Pray with dedication. Continue to pray. Why? Because here's what James tells us. The prayers of a righteous man or woman avail much in the sight of the Lord. So pray with dedication. Why? Because you have the power of Christ Jesus in you. The Father says pray with expectation because I will answer, pray with anticipation because I will lead you, pray with dedication because every time you sit down and every time we have a conversation, I am here to meet you. Amen? Amen. Father God, we bless you for the day, Lord, we pray that you guide our time. And Lord, as we continue this 30 days of prayer, Lord, speak into our hearts, Lord, there are marriages, there are body ailments, Lord, there are things in our lives, there are relationships that you want to heal and restore. Lord, there are victories that, Lord, we know, know nothing about yet that you're going to lead us through. Because, Father, we dare to pray and trust you. Because, oh, Father, help us to pray. And, Lord, spend time with you, hearing and understanding, having conversations with you. That, Lord, we would know your will in our lives. These things, Jesus, we pray in your holy, your mighty, and your blessed name. Amen. Okay, ready? Stand for the benediction. We go. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Today we're going to be talking about. <laughs> it was easy, wasn't it, sir? Pray for the food. I'm glad you guys love me. <laughs> Today we're talking about meeting Abraham, Abraham, the father of faith. And so we're talking about the freedom to believe. And the rest of oh, the rest of the book of Galatians is about the freedom we have. To trust God and apply the truth that we learned in the first half of the book into our lives. Turn in your Bibles, if you don't mind, to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 to 14, or you can follow along on the screen. 
Paul has talked to us, given us five questions of faith, and asked us those questions, and then he says this, <clears throat> he gets right to the crux of the matter, two issues for us. First one is faith, second one is law. Consider Abraham, who believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand this. Those who believe are children of Abraham. The scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham, saying, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Say that with me. The righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That's a lot packed into a paragraph. But here's what he's talking to us about. He's talking about faith. He's talking about the practice of faith and understanding the law. Because the law has nothing to do with faith. The law is nothing more than our own exercise of our trying to prove ourselves to God. This week, I had a couple conversations with folks. And here's three things that came out of those conversations. The first one is this. How can I accept the love of God when I'm unacceptable to my own father? We're going to talk about that for a moment today. Then I don't know how to I don't know how to depend on God or trust God. We're going to talk about that one too, because all that's in faith. And the third one is, I'm a realist. Give me something to do so that I can become worthy. <coughs> all of us have said one of those three things in our lives. Because those are three questions that always come up. Give me something to do so I can prove myself worthy. Because we grow up with, you're not good enough. We grow up with, do better. We grow up with, you got to do better than that. Well, we're going to look at all three of those as we look through the scriptures this morning. So who is Abraham? Abraham is the father of three great religions. He's the father of the Jewish religion, father of Islam, and the father of Christianity. We hold Abraham up with this great virtue of faith. He's a guy who trusted God. That's where he was supposed to be. Left the of the Chaldees and followed God. Go where I send thee. And that's what he did. But at the same time, when we look at Abraham as a paragon of faith, we have to understand that like us, he had holes in his shoes. Or my, 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 my term is, he had clay feet. His faith got weak. Don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. Okay? Because the people next to you will talk about you. Okay? How many times has your faith got in you? You go, oh, man, I don't know what to do. Oh, God. And so you make your own decisions as opposed to trusting God. We said Abraham. God says, Abraham, go where I'll send you. The first thing he does is he takes his, nep he takes his nephew Lot along for security. Because, you know, I can't do this by myself. I need somebody to lean on. God says, trust me. The next thing he does is he goes to Egypt. And he tells Pharaoh that his wife is a sister. Now guys, those of you who are married, I don't know what your wife would do, but I'm telling you right now, those words could not come out of my mouth, out of my mouth, before my wife would have had my head rolling on the floor. Amen. Because what he's trying to do is save himself. Amen, ladies. The next thing he does is, God says, I'm going to multiply your, I'm going to give you children as many as stars in the sky. What does he do? He starts listening. Oh, God, you got to do something. God, it's been 25 years. What do you want to do? And so he ends up with his son Ishmael. And God says, that is not the guy. Why? Because he keeps taking things into his own hands. That's what happens when our faith gets weak. 
Instead of trusting God's promise, we start making our own decisions, not listening to the Father. <coughs> Although Abraham had clay feet, like all of us, it does not invalidate his faith in God. God says, he believed me, he trusted me, he walked with me. Therefore, it is righteousness unto him. It is righteousness unto us when we trust and believe the Father. The free life begins with Abraham. Why? Because it's a life of faith and trusting the Father. The law doesn't come until 430 years later. Abraham eliminated the rest. He cheated a little bit with Lot. But we like safety. Instead, we eliminate the risk by following the Father. So here's five things about Abraham. The first one is he believed God. Here's Genesis 12, 1 and 4. Here's what it says. <clears throat> God is speaking to Abraham. Abraham is comfortable. <clears throat> He's got it made. He's 75 years old. He's more than comfortable. He's rich. Living with his dad. He's got everything he needs. God says, go forth from your country and your relatives and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Do what? Yeah. Leave three things. First of all, oh, here it is. First of all, leave your relatives. Leave your country. Leave your culture. Leave your religion. That's hard work because my culture and my religion are part of who I am, what makes me who I am. God says, leave that. Because I have something better for you. Leave your relatives. Leave your security. But I need my relatives because my relatives help me identify who I am, what I am. Because I'm Abraham, I'm 75 years old, and my nieces and my nephews and brothers and sisters, my dad, they all esteem me. And you want me to go work somewhere where I'm nobody? Yeah. Then I want you to leave your father's house. In other words, I want you to leave your riches behind to a place where I will show you three leavings. Leave your culture, your religion. Leave your security. Leave your riches. Why? Because I got something better for you. We got another story for you a moment. Here's what happens next. Verse 4. So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. See, that's a security. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran and on his way to Canaan. And he said, who has faith like that? That God would say, go to a place I'll show you. But the first thing we're going to do is, you know what I'm going to do. We're going to whip out our phone. Yes? Yes? yes. And we're going to whip up Waze or Google Maps or Apple Maps or somebody's map and say, tell me how to get there. You guys have to go to a place I'm going to show you. Now, I know a lot of faith stories. And some of them I know very well. But the one I know best is my own Carol and I are living in Cleveland, and God says, I want you to go to seminary. I said, God, my wife is pregnant, and we've got two nice jobs here. We're comfortable. The church likes me, and I'm the heir apparent, because Pastor Peyton said that as soon as he retires, this is going to be my church. I am good. And God says, no, go. I said, but God, this is good. I am right here. This is cool. This is it. God says, no, go. God says, pack. I pack a little box because I'm staying in Cleveland. And God says, go. So what do we do? We trust God. We come. We leave Cleveland. And I'm so glad we left Cleveland. <laughs> because we left Cleveland. If I'd stayed in Cleveland, I would have never met any of you. Not only would I have not, never met any of you, I would have never been able to go around the world and preach the gospel. I would never get to hang out with thousands and thousands of kids and adults. Because in Cleveland, my world was like this. But the Father says, go. And my world became like this. And sometimes it's so big, and I'm, I don't know what to do. The Lord says, I told you to go, dummy, go. And so I went. And that's what Abraham did. He believed God. And the key for believing God is not just believing that God is. But believing in God and that God is going to do the things that he said he will do. Amen. Go, he said. Okay. But God, Carol, so I'm much pregnant. Get out of here. But God, go. So we drive across 
country in the 1973 uh, 70, Buick Mustang with a big trailer on the back full of books and food. That was it. And the God said, God said, I will have everything you need when you get to California. Why? Because we're believing on God and believing in his provision. Trusting God means that I'm willing to leave what I have to receive what he has for me. The second thing we need to know about that is this, that it is credited him as righteousness. Credited is the idea, or reckoned as another version puts it, is the idea that God says, you are righteous because you trust me. What does the Father want from each one of us? He wants obedience. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to walk with him. And so as we trust him, as we walk with him, we are relying on him and his word. And so we are believing God, believing in God, that he is going to do the things that he said, that his word is actually going to come to pass. Abraham became a person for whom the invisible was much more real than the invisible. In my own faith journey, that's the story. I pray it through. I think it through. I pray before the Father. I read the word. Lord, show me. Lord, help me to hear. Lord, help me to follow you. Why? Because in our lives, faith for us is invisible reality like heaven. The Father says, I will do these things as you walk with me. And the Father says, these are the things that I have for you. That doesn't give us a card on credit card, but what it does mean is, Lord, help me to be still before you, that, Lord, I am following you, that, Lord, you may give me the things that you see I need, because, Lord, invisible reality in my life is what Hebrews 11 one says, faith is the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Why? Because we believe in God that God is going to do the things that he said he's going to do. For us, that's righteousness. You don't have to get your life together. That was one of the, one of the conversations, remember? How can I accept the love of God when I'm unacceptable to my own father? No. You don't have to get your act together. Wait till I get this done. I can do this without you. Oh, no. The father says, trust me. Let me speak into your heart. Let me speak into your life. Let me walk with me. Let me be your God. Surrender these things to me. I have much better stuff for you. And when the Father starts giving us toys, man, we can rejoice and enjoy because the Father has given them to us. Second thing about righteousness, God giving us, giving us his righteousness is this. That what God says to us is much important, more important than what man says about us. You hear that? When it is reckoned to us as righteousness, it is much more important about what we believe, what God says, than what man says about us. This person I'm talking about. Says, my father didn't love me. You know, he abused me. He said, this, 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 and this. God says, no, you are my child. I esteem you. I love you. I am here with you and for you. We don't have to get our act together because it is what God says. That's why Paul goes to such extremes to help us understand that our new identity is in Christ Jesus and in him alone. Our new self-definition is the fact that we are God's child. Our name is the same. But instead of just saying, I'm Gerald our man, son of Oscar and Maxine, Yes, I'm still their son, but I'm Gerald Man. Gerald, our man. God's son. You're whoever you are. God's child. Because God redefines who you are. Because your righteousness. Because you believe him. You trust him. You walk with him. Next thing is we don't settle for our own ambition. We settle for what God has for us. My ambition as a Cleveland was to take over Holy Trinity Baptist Church. I go back to Holy Trinity now, and yet people love me. And they're, they're, I, I grew up there, but they're all old. They're older than me. <laughs> sometimes I get a phone call, and sometimes Carol and I go back and one of the, one of the old ushers and deacons will say, Reverend, you need to come home. We need you here. And I go, but God has called me there. No, you need to come here. No, because the tough. No, i got to be there. Why? Because God has called me there. Because I can't look at the little here when God is saying, this is what I have for you here. In each of our lives, look to see what God has for you here as opposed to getting trapped here. 
Because the Father has much, much, much more than any of us can say, think, dream, or imagine. Ephesians 3.20. Because we trust Him because we're looking here with anticipation. We're looking here with what the Father says. Our acceptability to God, our righteousness comes when we're taking those. Here's the third thing about Abraham. All nations are blessed because of him. And how do you do that? Here's a guy out there, childless. He's 75. Look at these Herod. He's going through the desert. The Lord says, go where I will show you where to go. 75. No children. And God says in Genesis 15, do go out there and read the stars. Now go out there and count the stars. Now we had a solar eclipse here recently. Everybody was all hot and bothered and excited and it was a dream. Okay? But for me, seeing a total lunar eclipse in the mountains, that's where the money is for me. Because I was up in Lake, Lake Pyro once, and it was, there, was a, the, there was a total lunar <clears throat> eclipse. And suddenly, every, you could see stars upon stars upon stars. You could make out the constellations. You could see the satellites going by. It was incredibly beautiful. And so I take that over a solar eclipse any day. But God says, go out there. Because remember, he said there's not a whole lot of pollution in the desert. He goes up and he counts the stars. And he reads it and God says, if you can count those stars, that's how many of your descendants are going to be. And typically when we grow up, we just think that's talking about the Jewish people. But no, God is talking about far more than just the Jewish people. Here's what God says here. <clears throat> Genesis 12, 3 and 4. I will make you a great nation. That's a Jewish nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. He's the father of three religions. You shall be a blessing. You shall be a blessing. Then he says this. I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curse you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth will be blessed. How does that happen? It happens because God has used Abraham's faith to call men and women to righteousness that we may understand and know the righteousness of God. Now, Abraham's got to trust God here. Now, remember, he makes a mistake with Ishmael. He's 86 years old. He waits 11 years for, for Ishmael. He's 86. And God says, that's not the guy. You did your own thing. I want you to trust me. So Ishmael is at 86. When he's 100 years old, Isaac shows up. And even Sarah's doubting this at this point. Sarah's going, this is not going to happen, dude. You've got to do something better. Because God's not, God is not working. And sometimes we get frustrated. We go, God, when are you going to work? God, you said that. And God says, be patient. And so the angels walk by. The angels come. And they're sitting there. And Sarah hears them. And, and they're talking to Abraham. And they're talking about the fact that Isaac's going to be born. And he goes, yeah, really, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. He says, the angel says, listen, this, next, this time next year, your wife's going to have a baby. Sarah hears him outside and starts laughing. Why? Because if Abraham is 100, she's 90. And what are you doing here? Typically when people, when God speaks, people go, oh, she starts laughing. What happens? Isaac comes. Why? Because that is indeed the child of promise. All people are blessed. And then through Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob's 12 boys, and then Ishmael and all of Ishmael's descendants. Suddenly, the earth, God is populating the earth with people who will worship him and believe him. That's how all the families of the earth get blessed. Why? Because we start believing in the Father. Now, Paul then slips in this one for us because he wants us to understand. The just shall live by faith. Amen? Amen. We shall understand and live by the faith of our father Abraham. We will trust God and take his word and live it as reality in our lives. Amen? Amen? But then he goes back to the law for a couple of verses. He says, we are free from the law. We typically think of the Ten Commandments. But the law goes further. He says, curse are those who don't do everything in the book of the law. Well, the first place we go looking for the book of the law is in Exodus, because that's where the Ten Commandments are. And no, we have to go to Deuteronomy. Because Deuteronomy is where the law is given, where the rest of the law is. And so what does that law say to us in Deuteronomy? Are you ready for this? But well, this is a lot of stuff because it says you cannot keep the law. Well, God knew we couldn't, but here it is. Deuteronomy chapters 27, verses 15 to 26. Curses a man 
who makes an idol of molten or molten image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands, the craftsman, sets it up in secret. And all the people will answer and say, Amen. Curses the one who dishonors his mother or father. Curses the one who takes or moves his neighbor's boundary mark, who misleads a blind person. <coughs> Curses the one who distorts justice due to an alien, an orphan, or a widow. Curses the one who lusts after people. Curses the one who has unnatural sex. Curses the one who strikes his neighbor, speaks against his neighbor in secret, who accepts a bride to strike down someone. It just keeps going on and on and on. Cursed are you. Why? Because these are not the things of God, but this is a law. And here's how the cat verse says, Cursed is he who does not confirm to the words of this law by doing all of them. And the people all said, Amen. What just happened here? They're about to enter into the land. And so Moses is reiterating the law. And as he reiterates the law, he's saying, this is the law. This is the things that God does not want you to do so that you may see and understand and know that he is for you because he wants you to be his godly people. And our fleshly answer is always, yeah, I can do that. 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 Because that's our fleshly answer. Now, don't move your neighbor's boundary line. Or don't cheat your neighbor. Well, okay, uh, nobody will notice this. Do a little bit. Don't lead a person astray. Well, they won't know I'm mine. It's a little white lie. Nobody will care. You know, don't lust after someone. Nobody knows I'm lusting. You just say lusting in your heart. Well, no one will know what I'm doing. Why? Because these things are natural to us. And because of the sin in our lives, they just flow out of us. Because God knew that we could not keep the law. And so what does he do? He sends his son <coughs> for us so that Jesus becomes the curse of the law. Because each one of these verses begins with, Cursed is he, cursed is she, who does not keep this, who does not do this. Because our human nature is to sin. Our human nature is to lie. Our human nature is to cheat. So Jesus takes on and becomes a curse for us. Because the Father knew that we could not do it. Because when we start doing the law, what we're really doing is trusting in our own self to prove ourselves to God. That's the conversation earlier. Give me something to do so that I can prove myself worthy. Do this. Dance this way. The problem is when you start doing that, trying to keep the law, you become angry. You become frustrated. You get you, you, you lose heart, you lose hope. Why? Because the dance, the tune of the dance is always changing. You can't keep up. So Jesus says, I want you to understand this. The just shall live by faith. Amen? Amen. Faith. Faith is believing and trusting God. Then Paul returns to this and gives us three blessings. He says this. The cause of Abraham, verse 7, 8, and 9. Took 9 and 14. We are three things. First of all, we're Abraham's children. Many of us you know that song, Father Abraham had many sons. I am, you know, that's that whole thing. The son and daughter, I am one of them. And so we Let's just praise the Lord. Right, let's go. Well, that's true. I'm not going to do it for you. <laughs> but see, that is true. We're children, fathers, Abraham's children. Because as he went out and counted the stars, God is saying, because of your faith, everyone is going to get to know who I am. Because at one point, he says, go out and count the stars. The next time, God says, go out and read the stars. As Abraham reads the stars, God says, this is what your offspring will be. And as you reach the stars, you get, you get to see in the constellations the story of Jesus, if you begin with Virgo and end with Leo, you end up with the one coming of the Virgin, who is the suffering Savior, who is then the conquering King, who comes returning, killing the snake, who is the Satan, who is Satan. Because we get to see and understand. So Abraham gets to know. That's why Paul says, God preached to him beforehand that Gentiles, everyone, will get to know and understand God, who God is. We are his children. Because Abraham had the freedom, got that? Abraham the, had the freedom to believe. And that opened up a life for Abraham that he 
could not contain. Why? Because God said, this is all of God said, you're Abraham's children. This is all of you. The next one is this one. You are blessed. We're blessed by God's provision. All of the Father's provisions are at our disposal. Carol and I got to California. We had $35 in our pocket. I had to go to Fuller Seminary. We had no place to live. We had no place to put our baby. It's like Mary and Jesus. Where are you going to go? That's a bad illustration. <laughs> we pull up. We pull into Florida. And first thing is, we got to find a place to stay. So we stay at a hotel. And the guy gives us a break on the hotel for some reason. I had no idea. We pull in and say, hey, we're still at seminary. we got to go there. Oh, it's generally $50 a night, sir. We'll cut it in half for you. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's nice. God bless. Then I go over to the seminary. And so I go over, and now I've got to find a job. I've got to find a get registered for school. And I've got to find a place to live. And I've got a five-month-old pregnant lady out in the car. Five-month pregnant. Yeah. So then I go in, and so suddenly there's a group that about three blocks from the seminary that are trying to rehab some apartments. And they need a janitor. Well, I know how to janitor. I know how to be a janitor. And I know how to clean floors and stuff. And said, can you be here on Saturdays to manage the place and clean up the place and help us get ready? I can do that. Good. Here's a two-bedroom apartment. Your rent's thirty-five dollars a month. Can you do that? So we've got to figure it out. So in a day, I had a place to live. No furniture. We had a place to live. Had food in the, in the, in the, in the trailer. We had the hotel room cheap. And then my aunt calls back from down in Los Angeles and says, "Hey, listen, you're in town here. Yeah, we just got here. We're trying to figure out what to do." She says, "Listen, come by the house. We have no clue how to get to Los Angeles." Come down here, we got a baby crib for you, you can put the new baby in there when it comes. Great. Then the next thing we know, we gotta have the church. We gotta go to church. Amen? Amen. And be there on Sunday, be there every Sunday, amen. 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 So we find a church. We go to friendship. And we never left. And so suddenly, the next thing we know, we've been adopted by this church, and they like we do. We adopt people. We give them food. We do it. They took care of us because the Father says, "Trust in my provision, because I am going to bless you." And then the everyday work of the world, we we forget that. We look at everything around us and go, "That's just what God's supposed to do." Yeah, that is what God's supposed to do. And then we start taking them for granted, as opposed to realizing what God is doing in our own faith story. Because Abraham said, God said to Abraham, go, he went. The Father says, with us, believe, trust me. I will bless you with provisions. I will give you myself. With Abraham's children. And the last one is this, we are heirs. We're heirs of the promises of God. Princess Harry. And Princess William over in England, we, somehow we get fascinated with those folks over there. When they turned 30, they received their mother's inheritance. They had to wait until they grew up for the years to get the money. The father says, no, I have an inheritance ready for you now. It is yours. You just need to receive it. How do we receive the inheritance? It's simple. Jesus, help me to trust you today. Jesus, in my life, Lord, help me to understand who you are. Help me to have a relationship with you. Because, see, that's the difference between law and faith. Law is do. Check it off. Did you do it? Did you do it? Oh, man, I got to do it all over again. Oh, that wasn't right. Do it again. As opposed to a relationship that says, come. Let me be your God. Let me walk with you. And that's all that God told Abraham. Come. Let me be your God. Go, I will show you great and wonderful things. Come, walk with me. And that's what the Father says to each one of us. I have an inheritance for you now. Not when someone else dies, because Jesus has already died to give us that inheritance. But it is yours now. Just come receive it. Receive Jesus Christ. Walk with him. Lord, in my life, help me. Lord, to take my walk with you seriously. That, Lord, I would know and understand the faith relationship we have. That's all it is. Don't make it hard. 
Because when we make it hard, we start doing the checkbox. It's another to-do list. The Father says, no, just walk with me. I'll take care of the rest. We're going to pray. When I'm praying, if you need to or want to, encourage your relationship with Jesus Christ, just write that down on the back of your card. And place that in the back of your card. <coughs> Jesus, you've given us this model of faith, Abraham. Lord, he had clay feet. Lord, thank you. And Lord, you call us to serve you with our clay feet, with our issues, with our stuff, with those things that, Lord, don't seem right, Lord, those times when we don't even trust you. Jesus, speak to us. We bolster our faith that, Lord, we can trust you. These things, Jesus, we pray in your holy, your mighty, your blessed name. Amen.